and welcome everybody on this beautiful, it's a beautiful night out there. I'm from, from Winlock, Washington, and it's uh, 61 degrees out there right now. So it's been a beautiful day all day today. Uh, that This first slide right here was basically what Gary was putting out earlier, and I posted the, the Cheddar Up link in the chat for everyone to see. So without... I won't go into that anymore. He already covered it well enough. Unless you got questions, we'll okay. talk about it at the end. Or um, if hey, Gary, if you could, could you put out the first survey question? And go ahead and answer this question so we get a feel for what kind of uh, knowledge you have on this. And it's completely anonymous. Who's going to be saying what? Do you do worm composting? It's easy, yes or no? I'll give it five more seconds. Okay, there you go, Art. Okay, great. 62% said no and 38 said yes. Great. Thank you much. And the next survey question. You bet. The next one states, have you had success doing worm composting? No or yes? I like these easy ones. <laughs> okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, thank you. Oh, wow. 55% said no, that they had, uh, they had not had success, and 45 said yes. All right, and uh, one more question, and then we'll start, because I think that's going to be the first slide here coming up. Want me to go ahead and launch it, Art? Yeah, go ahead next with number three. Okay. This is an interesting question. What is the single largest component of our nation's solid waste? And the choices are food, glass, metals, paper, plastic, wood, and yard waste. Go ahead and click what you think and then submit it. Okay, we got about half of you. Okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right. Wonder if a lot of them went to the composting class yesterday. Very good. Good answer. Seventy-eight percent said food. Uh, seven, fifteen percent said yard waste, and seven percent said plastics. And we're going to see a chart here in a little bit that's going to really ver bring it, hit it home for us. So why do we want to compost with worms? It's going to remove food scraps and paper from the waste stream. Believe it or not, it's low maintenance. And it's easy. Provides valuable nutrients for your plants and improves plant health. Saves money on garbage fees and purchasing fertilizer. Check this out. Uneaten food is the single largest component of our nation's municipal solid waste. They're saying almost about 15%, but I can guarantee it's a lot higher. And these guys here take care of a lot of it for us. So this chart here breaks down and shows us just about 38.1% is kitchen waste, 
Green waste is 17.8%. Plastics is pretty slow, pretty low. Except for the other, well, if you add the plastics and the other plastics together, you're getting up almost to 7.3%. Um, so I only did three counties, Clark County, Collitz County, and Lewis County. I did those three counties, and this was the food waste that was uh, turned in for 2016. So you can see it's, the tonnage is really adding up pretty high. And a lot of this stuff doesn't have to go into the, into the, to the waste at all for our landfills. So the topics we're going to cover tonight, we're going to cover vermicomposting compared to composting, composting with red wigglers, bin moisture, pH, ventilation, habitat, feeding, lifespan, harvest, ding castings, use of castings, leachate, compost tea, types of bins, building a worm bin, savings, beneficials, and pests and troubleshooting. So first we're going to cover vermicomposting versus composting. What is the difference between the two? So let's go to our next question, Gary. Is vermicomposting a cold or a hot composting? It's either hot or cold. Go ahead and make your selection and submit it. Okay, five seconds. There you go, Art. All right, thank you. 90% said cold and 10% said hot. Great answer. So vermicomposting is a cold composting type system. Conventional composting is a hot or a cold depending on how you do it. Food scraps and bedding is what you get with uh, lower green nitrogen and brown ratios. And regular composting depends on the balance between the green and the browns. And you also need air and moisture. Vermicomposting takes six months, roughly. Conventional composting takes six to eight weeks under optimum conditions and depends on how much you work your piles. Vermicomposting converts waste by using micro and macro organisms and red wigglers. Conventional does the same thing with microorganisms also, largely bacteria in there. The bad part about it is it does not destroy weed seeds but you shouldn't get weed seeds in a vermicomposting bin if you're taking care of, if you're managing it correctly. Hot composting can destroy weed seeds if it, if it is done correctly. Your completed process has 4% more nitrogen than regular composting. And you can do it in a compact area with less management, which is very true. You don't have to work nearly as hard as you do with a composting pile. Okay, composting with red wiggler worms. Okay, there's a Latin name and they are considered a surface dweller that scavenges organic waste. They're also called a dung worm, manure worm, dung worm. And they have no teeth. They use a gizzard to grind their food. They have no eyes, but their skin is light sensitive, and their skin also must be kept moist so they can breathe. That's what a red wiggler looks like. Okay, a little bit about bin moisture. 
Optimum moisture is between 43% to 90%. If too wet and the water is collecting in your bin, the worms can drown. They only breathe through their skin. So what you want to do is you want to make sure it, the environment, the, ca the, uh, the castings or the bedding in there feels like a damp, damp sponge but not dripping. If it's like this, it's too wet. And if it looks like that, it's too dry. pH requirements. You don't usually have to maintain the pH. The, the food you put in there will help maintain that and all the microorganisms that work in there help keep the pH where it's supposed to be. They can tolerate a pretty high pH range from five to nine. And there's what a scale looks like with seven being neutral. You can go down too below or too high on that neutral scale. If you go to the left of that scale, you're getting into an acidic range. If you go to the right of that scale, you're going into the alkaline range. A mixture of few foods will keep the pH close, closer to the neutral range. Low pH can allow potworms to flourish and red wigglers to struggle to survive because they'll be fighting over the food. This is what a red wiggler looks like. And these are what potworms look like. You can get potworms in there. You just don't want to be overrun with potworms. They need ventilation. Air circulation is vital for the worms to survive so they can breathe. Smothering will occur if there's no air circulation. Plus, it helps reduce the smells and humidity. So this is a homemade worm bin. If you look where the, the oval is around the side of the bin, those are ventilation holes. The habitat. Optimum temperature is 55 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. They can tolerate higher and lower temperatures, 40 to 90 degrees. They usually, if they get too cold, they'll huddle together to keep warm or they try to escape. Worm bins can be stored anywhere, ideally keep in a cool, shady area with the lid on tightly. I keep uh, one of my bins I keep in my uh, garage outside and I just leave it there and I go down there and feed them. I give them the paper cover everything up and they do great down there. They've stayed in there for over uh, probably six years now and you just got to harvest and take care of them. We'll talk about harvesting later on. I've seen people keep them in laundry rooms. I've seen people keep them in pump houses, garden sheds, under an awning or an eave and some people keep them in the house. Depends on what you want to do. feeding them. They're living organisms, they got to eat. It's better to feed them small amounts than large amounts. And if you're going to feed them like vegetables, sometimes it's better to freeze that vegetables to help it break up. And it also controls uh, problems with fruit flies if you have that problem. And say you forget to cover your food, it'll uh, minimize fruit flies. Smaller pieces are better because worms don't have any teeth. Once again, they have to grind their food in the gizzard. And you can provide a variety of food. Feeding activity depends on the temperature. If it's warmer out, they eat more. If it's colder, they eat less. And if you do have a worm bin, what I do is I try to feed my worms on each corner of the bin. Each time I feed them, I do it at a different time. And I, I move from corner to corner to corner each time in the bin. Here's some of the types of foods they like. And we're going to get more into that. They like fruit peelings or spoiled fruit, except for oranges or other types of citrus fruits. So you can feed them just about every type of fruit, but kind of stay clear of the citrus.
any part of the vegetable that has been hasn't been cooked with oil or salt can be fed to the worms and they they like it they love it a lot they like corn they like broccoli they like carrots they like lettuce they like potato peels anything that you can give them they like moldy bread all kinds of stuff coffee grounds and tea bags you can even give them the filters When I give them a tea bag, I usually rip the tea bag open so they can get to the grounds. Coffee bags, I just uh, the coffee filters. I can you can throw the whole thing in. The filter will disintegrate. The tea bag will all disintegrate also in time. Moldy bread and rolls. It's one of their favorites. Okay, eggshells. All I do with eggshells is I rinse the membrane, get that sticky stuff out of the eggshell. I let it dry for a little bit, then I crush them up and I add them to the worm bin. Not very much, just a little bit. And once again, what they do is they take the eggshells in, it gets into their gizzard, and it helps them grind the food up. Other types of grit that will work will say was sand, calcium, oyster shells, anything that has any kind of grit. That's just an easy way to do the eggshells. Uh, put them in a plastic Ziploc bag and run a rolling pin over them to grind them up small, and just uh, give them to your um, your worms. Okay, we're ready for the last question, Gary. Do red wigglers eat meat? Yes or no? Can you feed them grapes? Yes. They like grapes. Okay. Five seconds. There you go, Art. All right. 6% said yes. 94 said no. Outstanding. What not to feed your worms? Chicken or turkey? Eggs or bacon? Hamburger? Hot dogs? Fish? Okay, meat, poultry, or fish, bones, skin, or drippings. These develop the odors, and they can attract other pests to get into your worm bins. Okay. Other things you want to feed is cheese, dairy products, citrus. And this is why the citrus, I didn't want to get into too much of the citrus, but these may produce an acidic condition and may be toxic to the worms. Oils can smother them. Pet feces, you want to stay clear of that because of the um, they're not beneficial to the worms or to the final compost product. So you don't want to, because uh, it's not a hot composting system, you want to stay clear of any kind of pet feces. Uh, you can use um, rabbit manure, anything but that eats meat, you don't want to feed the worm. So any other type of manure is fine, just not pets. When in doubt, leave it out. Okay, reproduction. Okay, each red wiggler has both sexes, but they still need to mate with another worm. Red wigglers reproduce 30 to 45 days after hatching, so they reproduce pretty quickly. And a red wiggler can create up to four cocoons per week. Each 
cocoon contains two to five worms. Population of, a wor of your worm bin can double within 60 to 90 days. So they multiply pretty quickly. Their lifespan is about four to five years. There's the size of a uh, cocoon. And here's one hatching out. Harvesting castings, there's, this is a, one of the better ways to do it. However, it's very time consuming. As you can see, what he's done here is he's laid a tarp down on the ground. He's emptied out his bin. And since the, he's doing it in the daytime, obviously, or you could do it under a light, the red wigglers are going to go down towards the dark part, going down towards the tarp and get away from the light. And he's just scraping away the castings here and putting them into a bucket. So you have to do this continuously. Let the worms keep diving into the soil or the castings so they go deeper and then just keep scraping them off. And then you separate the worms and you start your bin all over again. Okay, this is faster but more labor intensive. Okay, here's another method. This is kind of an easy way to do it. What they're doing here is they're putting some kind of net mesh bag in there. And what, they, what they're doing there is they're feeding on one side of the bin. So they're going to put all the food inside that bag. And the worms are going to migrate from where the, uh, they're going to migrate through that mesh. And they're going to go into where the food is and eat there. So all you end up doing is just taking that mesh bag out when you're done. And the rest is castings on the on the right hand side there. So it's all separated. Slower but no labor involved. It's kind of a lot easier. These are harvesters. So what you're doing on these are these are homemade harvesters. So you just put a tilt on the on some framework and put a screen in there, quarter inch screen, wrap it around some circles of buckets. And then you got some PVC pipe in the center there, put a crank on it, and you just dump the worm bin in and turn it. The castings fall down below and you collect it in trays, and the worms are going to come out the other end and go back into your worm bin. So this one's a little quicker and a lot faster. You'll still get some eggs and worms in the bins that you have to separate out, but not nearly as intensive as doing it all by hand. All right, red wiggler worms castings are even richer in nutrients than most compost, so they must be used sparingly. They're rich in bacteria, calcium, iron, sulfur, and 60 other trace minerals. MPK is about 553, so that's your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium, the three key in nutrients for um, fertilizer. And this is in accordance with the University of California. Okay, when you're doing annuals and perennials, this is just some ideas. Put a small handful of castings into each hole as you plant. Apply one to three inches of castings in the spring, early summer, and fall. This is on annuals and perennials. Flower beds, top dressed with one to three inches of worm castings and incorporated into the soil with a fork or a spade. Some more uses of the castings. House plants. Spread one half to an inch of castings around the established plants and scratch into the soil every two to three months. Lawns. I don't know if I'd have enough worms to do lawns, but if, if I've got five acres out there, I'd need a lot of castings to do my worms. So new lawns apply 10 pounds per 100 square feet. Established lawns, four pounds per 100 square feet. Potted plants. Scratch the top and add one half inch of worm castings and water thoroughly. Potting mixes and seed flats. One part worm castings to three parts potting mix. So we're going to talk quite a bit on this stuff as we keep on going through here.
collecting leachate. Leachate is the liquid that's going to drain off your bins, and it's that, um, it looks like a really dark, dark coffee. It has no odor. When applied to plants, you have to dilute it with one part leachate to approximately 10 parts of water. So it looks like a tea or an amber color. Now, I've done this before, and I've mixed one tablespoon of leachate, and I put it into a gallon of water, and that was sufficient to turn that, that water amber color. So you have to really watch when you're using this leachate and dilute it out pretty good. The microorganisms are most active when fresh. However, the container can be stored uncapped. And that's what I do when I make up leachate. I'll just store it in a container, I'll dilute it out, and I leave it uncapped, and I just use it as I go on. This is what the leachate looks like. And this is coming out of a bottom of a worm bin. If you're doing a worm bin correctly, sometimes you won't get any leachate until summertime when you're eating a lot of uh, fruits that are got a lot of liquid in them. So here's several worm bins collecting leachate into a into gallon uh, jugs. Okay, if you're going to make worm tea, you want to put the castings, and that's the, the bedding material that's inside. When you scrape away the, the paper and stuff, it's the bedding material that the worms are going through and changing all this shredded paper and stuff. It's, it's a, a brownish color uh, looking, looks almost like soil, but it's, they call it castings. Okay, you're going to put some of these castings in a cheesecloth or some kind of filter, and you just put it in water and let it sit. So it's got to be a warm water, and you, you steep it just like tea. Agitate it every once in a while to incorporate oxygen. In several hours to a few days, you're going to have warm tea. The tea should be a light amber color. If it is darker than that, simply dilute it out with some water. And then you're going to use this on your shrubs or your vegetables, anything you want to use it on that you want a fertilizer. Uh, you can use it as a foiler spray. I don't recommend doing that. I just it, it says to do it, but I don't do I don't spray my leaves at all. The castings should, used to make the tea are still potent. And we're going to show you some pictures of compost tea here. So this was a worm tea bag that was in a 32-ounce jug. And that was one hour with warm tap water. That's what that color looks like after one hour. There's a 32-ounce jug and a 104-ounce jug. And there's 12 hours of sitting. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. What's the difference between compost tea and leaching? Compost teas uh, is where you're using the castings that... Um, you put it in a bag and then it's tea. Correct. The, the castings are the, the bedding of the worms, right. and they've already been through the digestive system of the worm. The leachate is just a liquid that's fil being filtered by the castings, and it's not really been through the worm's digestive system. Oh, okay. Okay? So, and this is um, 24 hours after on a 104-ounce jug. So you can see how uh, quickly this turns to a nice amber color for you, and you can use it on anything. I've I've taken I've taken a jug of this uh, worm tea compost tea. I've put it into a a sprayer. A, I've gotten a pesticide sprayer from Home Depot. I put this stuff in a sprayer, and I went around. And I sprayed my tomato plants around the base and around my corn, 
and it's done fantastic for it. It's it's a fertilizer. It's I like it a little better than Miracle Grow, and I know what the chemical. You know, I know what I'm spraying on there. It's it's natural, organic, so it's a lot better stuff. Okay, here's some commercial type bins, and you can see they're kind of get kind of pricey. This one here is a worm hotel. Comes with everything. It runs for $131.95. This is a real fancy one. This is from Northwest Worms, seven cubic feet, $209. Here's another type of worm system. $345. Another type. $151.95 from Home Depot. Another type. That's Walmart, 1904. And another type of hotel. This is from Gardens Alive. It's a three tray, $149. So you can see you can get into all types of uh, varieties of bins. Just depends on what you want to do. We're going to show you how to make some homemade bins. Here's one type of homemade bin. And these are bins sitting inside of bins, basically. And they're draining down into, an, into a, a reservoir. And then it has a tap on the bottom to take the worm tea if you need it. And it's set up on bricks. So you can get something underneath there to drain it. And here's some instructions for this. And this is basically the one, this is an old bathtub that works just fantastic as a worm bin. So what you do is you put the bathtub up on, a, on blocks. You start your worm farm in there. The worms stay in and the outlet drain collects your leachate. And you can dig your castings out whenever you need them. Suge you have to put some type of cover over it to protect them. But it works great. We used to have a whoops. We used to have a lady that had one of these, and we used to harvest the worms from there. And we used to do our worm composting classes when we taught. But she had that thing was polluted with worms. Here's another type of homemade bin. This is the one that we're offering, and it's a seven-gallon tote from Home Depot. And this is another type of, I uh, found this one out not long ago. This is, uh, somebody's doing this up in Canada. They're putting a pipe in the ground, and they drill holes at the, they put about a two, it's about a two foot, maybe two foot, maybe 30 inch pipe, four inch pipe diameter, and they're drilling holes in the ground. They got a cap on top of it, and they put the worms inside there. They drill the holes that are buried in the ground, the worms go out into the soil, they do their thing, and then you feed them through the top of that pipe. I haven't tried it, but I heard it works. And there's the same type again right there. A two-foot length of four-inch PVC pipe, perforated bottom, and six inches with one-half-inch drill bit, and just buried in the garden. So this was, um, I saw this on a Canadian site. It was kind of interesting seeing it. And what they did was they put this in a raised bed, and they put it in different areas of the bed, and they just feed the worms through that grate up there, the, that screen. Okay, building a simple worm bin. Select a sturdy, it has to be an opaque container because you don't want light getting in there. And... Seven gallons or more is fine, but just remember, these bins start getting heavy as the castings start uh, developing, so that these bins get heavier and heavier. So here's a, a seven-gallon bin from Home Depot. Okay, I get teased about this five thirty seconds hole. This is just a drill bit I picked, but anything close to that is fine. It doesn't have to be exactly five thirty seconds. That's just a drill bit I picked. And you drill those ventilation holes up on the top. And then you're going to drill four to six drain holes on the bottom. Once again, that drill bit is something I, I just grabbed out of my drill uh, bin. And that's the one it was. So you're going to drill these on the bottom for drain holes. 
And if you get one of these bins that we have, these are already drilled out. You don't have to worry about the drilling. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to fill the bin up about a quarter of the way with shredded paper. And you're going to make sure that shredded paper is damp and you can squeeze it and, you know, you just don't want it where it's dripping and running, you know, wringing out water. You just want to make sure that uh, paper is uh, damp. And then you're going to add your mixture of red wiggler worms, castings, bedding, crushed eggs for grit and food. So you're just going to put that right in the bin. Then you want to cover the mixture after you put the food and the worms in. You want to cover it with a layer of damp shredded paper. And what that does, it filters out all your uh, smells and it covers the worms up. It gives them a place to hide. Then you want to make sure you prop the worm bin up on concrete blocks. So you want the holes at the lowest point. So you got to make sure that those holes can drain. So that's all you do is just set it up on wood blocks or bricks and you put a collection tray in, in front of the holes or underneath the holes. Sorry about that. And that'll collect your leachate and you just dump that in or use the leachate when you want to. Okay, here's, here's a big, here's something that was pretty interesting when I started doing some research on this. As you're going through, you're going to see some savings by doing it yourself. So cost of purchasing a worm bin, commercial, can go anywhere from $19 to $345. A do-it-yourself bin costs less than $10. Bucks. Purchasing worms. Check this out. $28 to $37 for a pound of worms. And that was from Northwest uh, Worms and um, Yelm Worm Farm. Those are the prices I got. So your initial cost for the worms is $28 to $37. However, once you have those worms, you don't have to buy them anymore because you're going to start, they're going to start reproducing and you can always add to your bins. So if you didn't, if you have to buy castings, $33 for castings. If you have to buy, if you want to use worm compost tea, that stuff runs $27 for 32 ounces. If you have a worm bin, it's free. So if, if you're doing this commercially, it can cost you anywhere from $107 to $442. If you do it yourself, you're talking $28 to $37, which is kind of reason. It's kind of a no-brainer to me. Beneficial organisms in the bin. There's all kinds in here. So you got your aerobic bacteria, your fungi and your molds, protozoa, you get potworms, millipedes, spiders and mites, springtails, gnats and their larvae, beneficial nematodes. So this is what these all look like in there. Okay, when you're doing a bin, you shouldn't get too many pests if you're doing it correctly, but if you do, if you get too much anaerobic bacteria, which it's going to start to smell, your bin is way too wet. You have to check your drain holes, and then you want to put more drying agent in there, like shredded paper, to get it dried up some. Fruit flies. Too much fruit. The way to prevent it is to freeze prior to adding, and then you've got to keep it covered. Once you feed the worms, you want to cover it. Slugs and snails. Just basically take them out, get them out of there, if you get them in your bin. If you get slugs and snails, I don't think you're going to get any slugs and snails in your garages or anything like that or your pump houses. But if you keep it outside, you, got, you could get issues that way. Centipedes, they're predators, get them out. Ants, usually your bin's too dry. 
flatworms. Just remove them. Okay, troubleshooting your bin. Your worms are dying. You're giving them too much food. It's too wet or too dry. Extreme temperatures. So those are just some of the things that cause your worms to die. Bin attracts ants. Bin is too dry. Just add moisture or shredded paper. Moist shredded paper. Bin attracts fruit flies or flies. Food is exposed or too much high sugar based food or fruit. Freeze prior to, prior to putting in and make sure it is covered after you feed. Your rotten odors, that's usually the bin is too wet, not enough oxygen. Check your drain holes and make sure the food is not exposed or too much food and the worms aren't eating them. Slugs, flatworms, and centipedes, just get them out of there. All right, also when you're feeding the worms, you want to feed uh, usually about once a week or once every two weeks. And what I do is when I feed, I, I go to each corner of the bin each time I feed in a different spot so I get my worms migrating through that bedding. Okay, in summary, and I oh, also I only usually give them about maybe a cup of food every week. However, you need to monitor that to see if they're eating, how much they're eating. So that determines how much food to give them. Uh, worm castings, I can't speak enough about worm castings or I can't speak enough about the worm, the, the compost tea. It's fantastic to use on your plants. It's great to use on the garden. Um, it's, you know, it's, it saves on buying miracle Grow all the time. I use mine constantly down in my garden. So we covered vermicomposting versus conventional. Composting with red wigglers, bin moisture, pH, ventilation, habitat, feeding, lifespan, harvesting castings, use of castings, leachate, your compost tea, your types of bins, your building a worm bin, savings, and beneficials, pests, and troubleshooting.